Welcome. Welcome to the Grace Channel. Grace on Fire. Bravely creating with wild abandon that which sets our hearts on fire. And we are so blessed and so I am so grateful and excited to have this most amazing guest. He's a dear and special person, <laughs> even a friend. He is Chef Brian Woolley. And he is on KUTV Channel 2. He, mm -hmm. is, he is the celebrity chef and TV personality. Welcome, Chef Brian. Welcome to Grace on Fire. So happy you're here. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. And of course, this is Gus Gus who's joining us. Gus is <laughs> joining us as well. Wonderful. He'll be back. <laughs> Brian, Chef Brian, I'm so excited to have you here. And I, I was, I went, it was down, it was maybe a year ago to the set and we yeah. met and I brought coffee and you cooked this most amazing dish and you allowed good. me to taste some and it was well, good. so healthy and so delicious and so amazing. And you're making these recipes for everybody can get on and watch your show. Every what time yeah. is your show? So every day, Monday through Friday, I'm on KUTV channel two here in Salt Lake City, Utah at noon to one. I'm part of the noon news. And then you can also join me on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. for Cooking with Chef Brian, which is a full 30 minute show of cooking. Wow. So please tune in. <laughs> Yes, yes. I know everything yeah. that you've made is is amazingly tasty and healthy. Oh, thank you. And healthy. So you you create a great balance and you're you're providing all these wonderful recipes and foods and you're obviously a master chef. Um, but my question is, Chef Brian, what is your favorite food? Oh, that's a great question. My favorite food food, honestly, without even thinking, I have to say fried chicken. <laughs> I love fried chicken. And it's because my grandma would make oh, the best fried chicken when we were growing up. Whenever we'd go to grandma's house, she'd always make fried chicken. And she had this old roaster oven. And she'd pan sear the chicken first and then put it in that old roaster oven that was just on the countertop. And like, kind of like an old slow cooker, but a roaster pan. And she would cook that chicken all day. I mean, for hours in there. And the house would smell so good. And it just these memories of grandma and sitting around the, the kitchen table with family and extended family. And we would have fried chicken and pickled beets, which mm -hmm. I love still to this day. So many people are like, oh, pickled beets. Yeah, I love them and green beans from the garden and everything, but oh, fried chicken. Very, probably the very top favorite food of mine because not only is it delicious, but it has so many fond memories for me. So mm -hmm. a family and grandma and, all that closeness and everything. So that's definitely my favorite food. Wow. Well, will you be put, will you be cooking that chicken on the TV show some one of these days? I've, I've done it several times, actually, okay. that if you go to the, my website, cookingwithchefbrian.com, you can type in fried chicken and it'll pull up several variations of fried chicken. And all of them are variations of grandma's fried oh. chicken. So, yeah. Perfect. Oh my goodness. Well, there you have it. The chef's favorite food. Grandma's and fried who, who doesn't love fried chicken, right? Oh, right. Especially <laughs> when grandma makes it. We, we, grandmas exactly. don't realize the influence they have on their family. True. It's when very it comes true. To the sustenance and food. Very That's true. Amazing. So Chef Ryan, you are on channel two here in Salt Lake mm -hmm. City. And I'm not sure how long you have been on, but I'd love to hear how long you've been on and the history of, you know, how you got onto TV, how long you've been on yeah, TV, sure. what your history of, of You TV? know, I'm the longest running TV chef now in America. So <laughs> right here in Salt Lake City, the longest, uh, 30 years just about. And it has a really interesting history to how I started onto it. I used to teach many, 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 many years ago at Sur La Top, which was a cooking store. And uh, 
one of the producers from Fox television called and asked if they had a chef that could come on. I just happened to be there getting ready for class. And so they handed me the phone. So it started there and I was on Fox television for years and then um, just migrated over to KUTV channel two. And that's how it started. And so it was such one of those wonderful things that, you know, I, 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 I love cooking. I love food. I love what it does for people. I love the happiness that it brings to them. But I also love to perform and I have a degree in music. And so I sang opera, believe it or not, for several years. And so I really missed that, that performing on stage and, and singing in that. So I created basically uh, an area, a work for me that involves two of my most biggest passions of performing and cooking. And so every day I get to cook and show people how to make their lives better, how to bring delicious food into their lives. And I get to almost perform in front of an audience, even though it's a cameraman and a camera, but you know, behind that camera are thousands and thousands and thousands of people, which I just love being able to show them how to make delicious food because I believe everybody needs delicious food. I kind of have a saying to where it's like, every soul needs good art and food is art. So mm -hmm. it's just one of those things that I'd love to be able to, to go through the grocery store if I'm shopping and have somebody come up to me and say, oh, I made your potato salad for our family reunion. And it was so wonderful and it made so many people happy. And I, I mean, you don't get better rewards like that in life than hearing that something you did actually attributed to the happiness of others. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so key. I wish, I wish more people would strive to live that way so that their lives bring happiness to others and not sadness. Mm, so true, Brian. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and it's delicious. <laughs> oh, yes. Delicious and happiness all wrapped yes. up in one yummy, decadent yes. food. And then... Of course, happiness follows. Or you can't help but to follow that. It's true. How could you not be happy when you taste some delicious food? Oh, yes. Yes. Life is short <laughs> and we need the, the decadent stuff to keep yes. us happy. <laughs> yes, that is true. Food is art and every soul mm -hmm. needs beautiful art. So Love that. Food is art. Mm -hmm. Food is art. And the way you yes, prepare it, it and present it is is art well it, it is and people forget too even the i firmly feel that the emotions and the love that goes into the preparation of the food are passed on to people i mean they feel if, if you're love i think that's why i love grandma's kitchens or mm -hmm. chicken so much is that it was made with so much love i mean it was grandma and so not only was it delicious but you felt such heart love in there when you were enjoying it so that is so beautiful it's so true i mean you, you you're, you're such a light being you're you just no, so much love and i and I, I believe that you know when you're preparing the food when you are in that state of wanting to bring happiness to others and just in your beautiful heart that that energy is transferred into the food and the energy oh of i'm i'm convinced of it yeah, I wouldn't want yeah. to eat food from an angry chef. <laughs> no, <laughs> because one of those things is, what did they put in it? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I want to eat food from you. <laughs> exactly. Thank yes. you. Yes, yes. Brian, uh, before we got on, we were talking a little, and you were telling me how you have traveled the world quite extensively. Yeah. You have done some traveling, which I, I want to hear about some of those travels. And I especially want to hear about your favorite place to travel. Well, sure. Favorite sure. You know, many, many years ago, I had a chef tell me that you can never be a chef unless you experience the cultures of the world and the food that they represent. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of made it a life mission at that point that I wanted to travel more. I love to travel, 
And so I made it a mission to go travel. And so I've been through uh, Russia and I've been to, into the Netherlands and through Scandinavia and Europe and America and South America up into Canada. And wow. the latest and greatest, um, the Far East, which I have to say, Japan is one of the most amazing countries and probably the top of my favorites of travel. And I've got to tell you a little story about this because, you know, I, everywhere I go, I think, oh, could I open up a store here? Would that be fun? Would it be worth it? And I thought, oh, I'll come over to Japan. Let's see, you know, what they have over here. I was mind boggled at the perfection. I don't, I don't know if I could open anything in Japan because they are such perfectionists. Mm. Everything is perfect over there the food is perfect the the, the packaging is perfect that the food comes in the, the display the presentation it was such an eye-opening experience of beauty to me mm. for the food and the way that it's prepared the, the the master's hands behind that I went over and actually uh, worked with the master sushi chef to learn how to do sushi and you know, just how, how they cut, how they fillet a fish, how they present it, how they make the rice, which, you know, so many of us, we make rice, we throw rice into a, a pot, throw some water and boil it till it's cooked and, you know, stuff. But it's not like that. I mean, it, there's so much care, there's so much um, history, there's so much just hours and hours and years and years of experience that go into making just that rice. For sushi, wow. it was mm. it was beyond comprehension for me at the time because it, I was not expecting that. And so, not only from a culinary standpoint, Japan was brilliant, but also from a historical and beauty standpoint, it was unsurpassed for me. I mean, the culture of Japan and and the way that it, the history of it and everything, how the food just intertwines with all of that is it's just, it's very humbling to see that because it just, it was beautiful to see everything that they would do from the sushi, from um, just the regular dinner, from just rice, how they would prepare rice. And I got to tell you, my friend, I had fresh rice right out of the rice field. It was amazing. It was amazing. The rice that we buy in the store here and cook up and think it tastes good. It tastes nothing like fresh rice out of the field because fresh rice just has this most nutty and aromatic and just aromas and flavors to it that I think dwindle and kind of disperse when it's stored and dried over long periods of time. Just, just like many foods you experience that way when you have the fresh uh, food and you're like, oh, this is so different from something. And believe it or not, another one is the potato. If you've ever had a fresh dug potato versus one that you've just bought from the store, there is a huge difference in flavor, textures, taste. Um, it's just fresh is always the best thing. And that's kind of the, the little unspoken word of a chef is that they have three ways that they always go fresh food first mm -hmm. and then frozen food next because generally it's frozen fresh. And the last is canned food or processed food. Yeah. And so, you know, everybody that listens, please go out and, and use fresh foods, use fresh ingredients, uh, foods that are in season, uh, foods that are locally available, go to your mm -hmm. farmer's markets and enjoy fresh foods there. And just really enjoy everything that it, it can bring to your life. It's beautiful. That's what happened to me in Japan is just experience the whole culinary awakening that I was not expecting and so it just is a top favorite of my place to go now so I can't wait to go back <laughs> wow I you've got me inspired I want to go and oh god <laughs> <laughs> it it is truly amazing the one thing is though I I, I can't stand slurping sounds mm -hmm. and when I did one of these genealogical ancestry DNA tests you know, that are so readily available now yeah. with so many different companies, I found out that it is actually a genetic disposition, that sound. And there is a name for it, and I can't remember what it is, but there is a name for that uh, 
disposition and I have it, you know, it's so funny. And so it runs in my family, I think. And and the Asian culture, they slurp a lot. They, you know, they enjoy their, they enjoy their food. They, I mean, they savor it and everything. And I was in a ramen shop and I couldn't get out of there fast enough because they were slurping all around me. And I'm just like, oh, I can't stand that sound. But um, it was well worth it. I'd go back in a heartbeat and do it again. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, when all these restrictions lift off, we'll... Oh, heading out. can't wait can't oh, wait beautiful tropical places and yes and can. there is something about just lying on a beach that mm -hmm. is pretty darn good <laughs> mm -hmm. it's always nice to get away it's always nice to, and it's nice to see a different world and see how different it cultures is. live and as a chef you know how different food is prepared and that experience well, in it's, japan yeah, it, it, it's amazing because I don't think a lot of people realize that food is a direct reflection of the art and the culture mm -hmm. of the people. Mm -hmm. So I remember when I was studying uh, many years ago in college, getting my degree, one of my professors said, well, it's like Italian operas. They're, they're very lyrical. They're very light. They're very airy. They're very enjoyable to listen to. And that's because it represents their food. The Italians, when they want something for dinner, they go out to the garden and they see what's ripe and what's in season. And that's what they cook with. And their operas reflect that. Mm. He says, now contrast it to German operas, which are very heavy, um, you know, Wagnerian, just very heavy, deep operas. And he said, their foods are very pickled. And mm -hmm. so they preserve a lot of their foods uh, for the winter months from the summer. And so they don't have that privilege of going out and finding you know, what's ripe in the garden every single night of the year. You know, They have to plan ahead and preserve and pickle their foods. And they said their operas really represent that. They're not the light, airy, lyrical operas in general for German operas. They're very heavy and, and stout and <laughs> very, you know, they, they just have a lot of oomph to them. And that's simply because you, you said, look at the food of just the two different areas and compare the art of the two different areas. And I thought that was very fascinating at the time, you know, all those years ago. And I've kind of just kept that through my life that truly, Food is art and it is reflected in the culture. It is art and it takes an artist to prepare it, put that love into it, make it beautiful and fresh like you do. And no, you thanks. ever sing opera while you're cooking your meals? Um, I do a little bit. I don't sing as much as I used to anymore. One, I don't have really the opportunities to sing and, and my life path has taken me in, in a different direction from that singing, but I still enjoy it. I come from a very musical family. I grew up thinking that my mom was Julie Andrews. I mean, yeah. she sounded just like mm -hmm. Julie Andrews growing up. And um, her sister was also a soprano who sang uh, with the San Francisco Opera. And um, my cousins would always joke and say, yeah, we pretty much grew up watching our mom die over and over on stage <laughs> in oh, the operas, you wow. know. Uh, and so it, it, it's true, but I grew up loving to hear my mom sing. I, you know, I thought she was Julie Andrews and Mary Poppins and I'm like, mom, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I enjoy music. I love music. I think it's beautiful. I enjoy hear, listening to it and I really enjoy all types of music. I think they all have a place. There are some that I prefer over others, but um, I think all music is fascinating because it is another language. Yes. And so you feel the language in your heart. That's how you speak mm -hmm. uh, with music. It's, it's heard and understood in the heart or the soul. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have you sing a little opera while you're cooking sometime. Just for fun. <laughs> I have on occasion. On occasion. I'm I sure have. in your home. Yeah. yeah in that been, beautiful there. kitchen of yours. <laughs> oh, thanks. 
Well, Brian, Chef Brian, thank you so much for being on this highlight for Grace on Fire. We were so honored to have you. And My pleasure. That Chef Brian Woolley at dot com is the the your... uh, cooking cooking with Chef Brian dot com. Okay, so you cooking can head over there with Chef with Brian dot com. Perfect. Check it out, and you have your recipes. You post them. Pretty much yeah. daily, what you're you're showing and cooking, so people can go. Oh, that's wonderful! Yeah. So go and check out some of his amazing recipes. They're all delicious. They're usually very healthy too, and decadent, and yes, filled with love. Yes. Um, we're so honored to have you on the show. Oh, the honor is mine. Thank you for having me. And you are so welcome. And we are going to move into our conversation, our Grace on Fire conversation back and forth with uh, myself and you, Chef Brian Woolley. Mm -hmm. uh, did you come up with any ideas while you were waiting for a conversation? Well, I want to know what your favorite food is. Oh, <laughs> I have so many. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> my favorite favorite food hmm, let me think about it right now if I could have you know it kind of changes from day to day because I'm in different I usually eat kind of what I'm in the mood for sure sure yeah so I'll, I'll ask you one other question while you're thinking about what is your least favorite food oh thanks <laughs> um my least favorite food, probably lima beans, just because of the oh. texture. I don't like the mushiness inside of the lima beans. I never oh, had well, yeah, yeah. But I that's, that's probably maybe one of my least favorite. And and you know, I like spicy things. I like um I'm 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 I'm, I'm just not gonna I love salmon. Like whenever I go mm -hmm. to a restaurant I order salmon. Mm -hmm. Almost just so often. I just love that's I will say that's my favorite. Salmon. Salmon. Yeah. Wild caught. Like always salmon. the wild caught, of course. Mm -hmm. I just think salmon is so delicious. I could eat it every day, I think, and I would be mm -hmm. not wanting for anything. Just maybe some potato chips on the side or some nice <laughs> hot French fries on the side. Amen to that. <laughs> I do vegetables. love potato chips. Oh, potato. I know that's what first popped in my mind, but I was too embarrassed to say. I do oh, don't be embarrassed. Chips. Don't be embarrassed. Make I some salmon my, with some my, fish and chips. Yeah, my vice is chips and salsa, so. Yeah, my gra my grandmother actually used to make um, fish and chips by scratch. Oh, yeah. You know, peel yeah, the yeah. potatoes, fry them, and fry the fish, mm -hmm. and she do it in a little skillet, like same thing on the countertop. And sometimes we take it to the beach. She do fried mm -hmm. chicken too. She did fried chicken, okay. take that to the beach too. And she did a lot yeah. of fish and chips. She was from England. Mm -hmm. So, you know, fish and chips and potatoes. And it was very sad to have her uh, fish and mm -hmm. potatoes. And grandmas are good cooks. Yes, they are. Mine was at least. <laughs> we know yours were because it has inspired you for your favorite it has. food. It has. Yes. yes. Hey, how about you share some of the food from some of the other cultures you've traveled to? And sure. Yeah. Well, that's always so interesting because you know in Czech Republic the dumplings are amazing, and so if you go there, you've got to have the dumplings and. And they're very known for their beers. And so if you're a beer drinker, you'll enjoy that. If not, I would suggest tasting some at least so that you can get an, an idea. I mean, they're very famous for them and they're dumplings. And then you move more into uh, like Japan. There's a lot of fish, a lot of seafood, which I love. And so that was very enjoyable to me and, and many, many things done with rice. And so that was interesting to me because they didn't grow wheat. That was a European thing. And so mm -hmm. most of their culture stemmed around rice. And then you move up into uh, the Scandinavian areas to where you get a lot of uh, potatoes, a lot of uh, milk products. And so a lot of cream-based or milk-based soups and sauces that go with things over that. 
And then I always, um, you know, strong heritage of England. And I always kind of joke there and say, oh, they just boil everything. So you have a lot of boiled food <laughs> in yeah. England, um, up in that area, you know, boiled potatoes and vegetables and meats, even uh, eggs. for that matter. Mm -hmm. Eggs, that is very true. And then you get into, you know, Italy, uh, very fresh ingredients of tomatoes and mm. tomato based sauces and and noodles, which are actually dumplings also. And so they're just a different type of dumpling. And um, so a lot of variations on those. And then down into South America, a lot with corn. And so you have mm. a lot of flavors of corn, of corn puddings and different mm. um, dishes that are made with corn from cakes to savory items, which are fun and delicious. And of course, everywhere you go, they, they generally will have beef or salmon also, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of chicken for that matter, and salads that go along with that. It's just what they serve next with them um, that may be different in, in Brazil, for example. It's all rice and beans with everything. And so you can have chicken and, and a green salad, but you always have rice and beans that are served with them also. And so it's fun to see the variation of the different foods. And, and remember that food is the common denominator of humanity. We all have to eat to live. And so everybody eats and how they do it is kind of you know, different. When you get into Ethiopia and some of those African countries, what's really fun are the flatbreads, the variations of flatbreads, because then they actually use those as utensils to pick up the various foods that they're eating and so I find that to be very fun because I loved who I mean even since a kid we loved working touching things with our hands and everything yeah so you you know you, you tear off a piece of bread and you reach over and you you use the bread to grab something and you eat it and enjoy it in uh, family style with friends around the table and so it's really fun and I don't, a lot of people don't realize that state dinners here in America were created and started to open negotiations with other countries because when you sit down to eat, you generally will talk and visit. And that's one of those fun little facts that maybe people didn't know. And another fun fact uh, with Japanese food is it's always served cut up when it comes to you. And the reason for that is everybody had to leave their souls before they went into the dinner hall, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have any way to cut it. They didn't have knives. And so it would always come cut, pre-cut for you to just eat. Mm -hmm. And so it's just the, the cultures and the food are all the same ingredients for the most part. You know, you've got potatoes, you've got meat, you've got some type of vegetable on the side, but the way that it's prepared definitely reflects the area that you are traveling to and it's it's just fun to see everything even here in America you experience different foods uh, to where you move more towards the coastal regions and you have a lot of seafood options mm -hmm. that maybe you wouldn't have more inside you know internally in the United States but internally you have a lot of corn and wheat and dairy that maybe you don't have on the coastal areas. I mean, now with, mm -hmm. with the way that we trade in economics and that you can get anything anywhere for that matter. But, you know, you start to really notice though that what's traditional is generally a favorite of the locals mm -hmm. or um, the specialty of the chef. And that really kind of triggers off the fun adventures of food and everything it has to offer. So those are some of the fun ways that people will experience foods when they travel around. And Europe is very hoity-toity with utensils and properness and, and uh, delicious baked goods and pastries and mm. oh, cream sauces and sauces mm. in general. So mm, you're that's making what me I want to travel. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm already there. I'd love to be traveling right now, but oh yeah, can't travel right now. <laughs> Not now, but soon, but soon. And yeah. when we do, yeah. I know for me, when I go, I'm from back east and I grew up on the coast. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's nothing like going and getting some seafood when it's been just right out of the ocean. Oh, you know, that fresh. 
<laughs> fresh caught that day. Yeah. It, it's not the same when you take it out of a frozen package or no, you know, no, no, it's not. It's not. And it's like what you were saying about with with Italy, the farm to table, and mm -hmm. and with Japan, where they'll go and mm -hmm. they'll get that rice or that but dig that potato right out of the ground and then yeah. serve it, and the the taste is better. It's better oh, it's when it's better. fresh. It's fresh and right out of the ground. Much, much better. The whole farm mm -hmm. to table movement, local um, and fresh is, is, I think it's healthier too. It's much healthier. Oh, it's, it's much healthier. But the one thing, and I'll tell you, Grace, that's um, kind of frustrating is people have to remember the farm to table movement is dependent on where you live. For example, we're here in Salt Lake City. We have great growing season about four or five months of, you know, out of the year. The rest of the ground's frozen, so we don't mm -hmm. grow things in the ground. And so we have to take advantage during those months of the freshness of the food, the abundance that we enjoy here. And True. we're kind of like Germany, you know, we have to preserve our food for the winter. So true. So true. Yeah. And preserve it in the best way that we can so that it yeah. keeps its nutrients and it keeps its taste mm -hmm. and i think we do a pretty good job of that nothing we like do. fresh but we do do a good job and and fortunate for those cultures that it is moderate year round and they can grow year round 365 days a year and just have their gardens and oh their yeah plants. wouldn't that just be wonderful oh, oh, yeah. i would love it at least <laughs> I would love it. or either that or you know we're here in the north and, you know, we have six months where we got, we can garden and growing season, and then we can fly south somewhere tropical and beautiful for the cold months. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that's what the I birds have to say, do. I, They're pretty smart. Yes, it is true. Yeah, maybe we should take a, a clue from them. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to say, I do love the four seasons. I love mm -hmm. spring, summer, fall, and winter. I love that change. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I would do in an area that it didn't have those four seasons. I do love those. Mm -hmm. I do love the change too, but I've noticed, I, I have noticed uh, that winter gets less and less desirable. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will give you that one. Cause I've noticed me that way too. <laughs> I mean, I would, I love winter around like Christmas, December, maybe even half of January. I'm really into it and can snowshoe and, um then i'm i'm ready to fly south with the birds to somewhere tropical yeah. and beautiful and open my windows and my doors and smell the fresh air yeah. and walk outside with no jacket i'm an outdoor yeah. person. as you can see i'm I, I i'll be outside until it starts freezing out <laughs> yeah well that's that's the thing to do i have to say i do enjoy winter through pretty much december January, February, March, I start getting a little tired. It's like, okay, now it's just cold. <laughs> There's yeah. nothing really to look forward to. You know, Christmas, you're all excited for yeah. it. Thanksgiving, you're excited for it. Yeah. But then, you know, after Christmas, after New Year's, it's just kind of like the drudgery yeah. of winter. <laughs> yeah. After about mid January is when I'm starting to go, like, oh boy. That's when I fly down to Costa Rica. <laughs> But I don't know about this year. I'm I'm hoping I, I wasn't able to last year, but I'm I'm hoping for this year. Fingers crossed. Yes. 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 Well, this has been a magnificent conversation about food yeah. and cultures. And I thank you so much, Brian, for this oh, beautiful conversation. I feel like I've talked your ear off. You you know, you get oh. me started about food and I just don't hush up at all <laughs> well don't don't we love hearing you we love hearing you you're a chef a master chef a tv oh, show, celebrity you. chef and we want to hear what you have to say and i i'm so fascinated by all that you've learned through your years 30 years on tv cooking yeah and all the cultures you visited and the foods that you've experimented with and tried it's just i'm I'm inspired. I am inspired by you, Brian. Oh, Chef thank Brian you. Brian so Woolley. <laughs> yes, thank you for joining us on Grace on Fire Conversation. Well, it's been on fire. How's that? <laughs> yes.
<laughs> yes, we keep it. We keep it on fire. And we are going to conclude our our Grace on Fire show today with a channeling from John. And this was a message that he sent just yesterday. And I asked him, how can we best serve? How can we best serve? And this actually wasn't for this show, but when I was looking over some of the channelings, I said, well, this was good. And it was just yesterday. Let's just go with it. So I am going to put on my Word document, okay, which should have been up. Oops. Uh, hold on. on I had it pulled up but it's not pulled up we'll just cut all this out <laughs> I had it pulled up I don't know where it went um, did I just disappear on you no nope, you're still there all right all right I got it oh no nope. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why it's not opening for me. Maybe it's not the channeling we're supposed to read. <clears throat> like we had said earlier today, electronics. It's true. <laughs> All right, I got it. It was open, I just couldn't find it. Okay, so welcome to Grace on Fire Messages. We will be sharing a message from John the Beloved. This is a message from John uh, that he shared yesterday, October 12th. I asked him, how do we best serve? Question mark. This is a powerful question because it is an empowering question. We have the freedom and power to direct our attention to create that which we desire to create. We have the power to direct the mind to choose the thoughts we think, therefore the emotions and forms that arise from those thoughts. We have our hands on the wheels of a powerful tool, our mind-body-soul connection. The most powerful thing we can do to serve with this power is to create consciously. We do this by stilling our mind, mastering our thoughts, and becoming a conscious embodied presence in this life. Stilling the mind and quieting the mind helps by meditating and meditative practices like walking meditation or yoga. Mastering the mind comes with vigilance and knowing what you want to create and the thoughts and emotions that will out manifest those desires in choosing only those thoughts to focus your attention on. Becoming an embodied presence is knowing what you are as a conscious awareness, infinite soul power, the ground, the silence in which all sound arises from, the stillness from which all life arises from. Peace is the beginning and peace can only be found in stillness and silence of heart and mind. Peace is the foundation and all that arises from and in and through peace benefits 
all. Peace is our beginning and peace begins with us. We need to know deep down in our heart, mind, body, and soul that our inner peace is our responsibility and no one, no thing other than our own self can provide peace but us. Peace is always an inner choice. No one can choose peace for another. It is always, always an inner choice that is always available and is truly a state of mind. This state of mind peace is one of a trillion states of mind. Yet it is the one that leads us home to truth and reality, to love everlasting and unending joy. Peace comes with nothing. It is free of all resentments, free of all holding, control, fear, past or future. Peace rests in the now, in the mind, it simply is. When we realize we are empowered to choose any state of mind, including peace in all circumstances, at all times, we are free to choose the state of mind that benefits us the most, that connects us the deepest to our own soul power and benefits the world. Peace is the bridge that connects us to our own pure consciousness that is our true self, our true power and strength. And when we live in that place in us, we bring the greatest service to humanity. John the Beloved. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for being here. Thank you for your time, for all your wisdom and all your beauty, your joy, and the powerful love that exudes from your being. You are very welcome. The pleasure was all mine. Always a pleasure to visit with you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for being here. Thank you, all who are watching, and we're wishing you a most beautiful and most blessed day. Namaste. <laughs> yeah.